Hello, my name is Claire and welcome back to Green Living Podcast. This week I wanted to take a very focused look at what sustainability is and what greenwashing is. These terms are flung around a lot and so I wanted to take a micro look and break them down so this can be a reference for anyone starting their journey. I will break them down asking what, why, who, and how to make informed choices. So let's start off with sustainability. Sustainability at its core is balance. It is the ability to exist constantly or have a constant rate or level. Sustainability is not only related to the environment, there is something called the three pillars of sustainability, which are the economy, society, and the environment, or some may know it as profit, people, and planet. In terms of the environment, it is maintaining an ecological balance of natural resources, meeting our needs without compromising the future of Earth's health. So sustainability is not the same as, quote, going green. Gre- going green is a little more surface level. A lot of choices I have made over the past few years, I would now consider to just be going green and possibly not being sustainable. And that's been a really big motivator for me to start this podcast and to start a blog is to move to the next phase of my life with sustainability instead of just making certain green choices. I really want to live a more sustainable and zero waste life as I talked about in the first podcast episode. In a nutshell, going green is a little more f- of a flexible term while sustainability is more clear cut and sustainability is to not jeopardize future generations ability to meet their needs you can be green or going green while being more sustainable and it's all a process and a journey but i would say sustainability is the step after going green or making certain green choices why be sustainable My answer to this question is, why not? If you have made it this far in the podcast series, in this episode alone, then I hope sustainably living or sustainable living interests you. So why be sustainable? Some social effects or benefits are being able to interact with people who share the same ideas and motivations. This can motivate you to make lifestyle changes that you never thought you could. It brings people into your life that makes you happy and you share a passion with. I find that people with a passion you're able to connect with if you have the similar passion and you're able to make choices and move together forward and you're able to meet new people, maybe make maybe make new friends that share a common goal of living sustainably or zero waste or you can maybe help people start their journey if they also feel passionate about it. Ecologically, there are a lot of benefits by choosing more sustainable companies to go with or just upcycling a lot of things. You're not taking away resources from animals. You're not destroying their habitats. So why be sustainable for yourself? There are a lot of benefits. This could resonate as less, quote, stuff, less stuff physically, less stuff mentally, maybe, maybe a healthier way of thinking, a different way of thinking, a healthier mind. This can go along with some form of minimalism as well. I think a lot of sustainable practices cut out a lot of unnecessary things in our lives, and you're able to see the world in a different light or in a different way. For yourself, it's healthy for healthier for the environment, your personal home, and everyone's home, the planet. You can be free from big corporations, and maybe you will find more of yourself through less junk and more awareness. And maybe through your sustainable journey, you find other things that used to take up your time and doing unsustainable things, or 
unsustainable practices. And maybe making your own products is a new meditation for you and an enjoyable activity. And I do think less junk and more awareness is very helpful for mental health. So who can be sustainable or live sustainably? Anyone can be sustainable or choose to make more sustainable choices. If you're beginning at this journey like I am or someone who has been green or been making, you know, quote, greener choices, it may not be perfect right now or in the beginning of your sustainable journey, which I'm sure mine is nowhere near perfect right now, but it's better. It's a lot better than past choices I would make maybe as a teenager and it's oh, it's the striving to help rather than hinder the planet. And who else would benefit from being more sustainable are companies. There are large there is a large market of people out there that want sustainable things and want to see companies that they like and have liked maybe for a few years or decades be more sustainable and ethical in their practices. At the end of the day, really anyone can be sustainable or choose more sustainable practices. It just takes effort and time, but it's worth it. So how can you live more sustainably? So this is a short list of about 10 things to live sustainably. There are a lot of practices that are out there and a lot of things that I have not yet incorporated into my life that I hope to. My first tip is think local. Try to buy food or produce from local farmers markets if they are available to you. Support local restaurants. Anything that you can do that is local is very beneficial to the community and the environment. If you want to take this a step further, try to reduce online orders or do not order anything online at all. This can be really hard, and I don't think at the moment I would even be able to cut out online orders because, unfortunately, where I am right now, a lot of the sustainable brands or sustainable products I have to find online. And I hope that eventually a lot of stores will start supplying more sustainable products. But as of right now, I've been doing some orders online to get sustainable products. And a lot of companies that I have purchased from actually have carbon neutral shipping. And so that means that they partner with a company or they donate money to be able to plant trees. And that's how they're able to do carbon free shipping. My second tip is to make your own things, whether that's dresses or clothing, face wash or scrubs. YouTube and the internet is overflowing with DIYs for everything and I'm hoping to try and make some of my own recipes and those will eventually be shared on the blog when that launches. And in making your own things, upcycling is the biggest thing when it comes to making your own things. So if you're making your own clothes, then taking an item that you already have and using that material to make something new. Or if you're wanting to make a homemade beauty product such as chapstick, you can reuse a jar from a previous item that you used up. My third tip on how to live more sustainably is our electricity habits. So for the thermostat, maybe having a daytime and nighttime setting for the thermostat. I know we are home most of the time now because of quarantine, but it's way better for the environment as we move into fall to put on an extra layer of clothing rather than turning the thermostat up a few degrees. And the reverse of this in the summer is to open windows during the day to let in a breeze if there is one as long as it is a safe temperature to do so. Another thing with electricity is look for the Energy Star when buying new appliances. This is meant to reduce greenhouse gas pollutants and other pollutants from improper energy use. It is a government program that certifies Energy Star products. And hang dry clothes instead of using a washer. This is something that I've recently started doing. 
I will only be able to do this during the summer because of the environment that I live in. It will get cold and rainy and snowy in the winter, so during the summer, I've been hang drying clothes instead of using a dryer to help with my energy use. And the fourth thing on how to live more sustainably, I'm going to say it again, probably in every single episode, is cut out single-use plastics. And this can be things such as cutlery, cups, single-use razors, etc. And if you get takeout, actually, plastic containers that they come in, the food comes in, save them and reuse them. They are designed for food. Styrofoam is a little different. Styrofoam is tricky. That's not... That's not great. So maybe even try to order from restaurants that you know you will be able to reuse their plastic containers. So again, just how to live more sustainably with cutting out. Single-use plastics is a huge thing, and if you're not able to cut them out completely, try to make sure that whatever plastic is coming into your life, you're able to reuse it in some way. My fifth tip for how to live more sustainably is when you purchase an item, ask yourself, Three questions. One, how long will this stay in my house? If it's a single-use plastic, it's going to be there for a day or two. That's not a sustainable choice. Maybe look at alternatives for that product. Second question, is it a one and one product that will end up in the landfill? As I said before, if it's a single-use plastic that's going to hang around for a day or two, it will inevitably end up in a landfill and or in the ocean or in a waterway. And the third thing is, is it an item that will have years of use and not put any toxins in the earth when it does leave my life? Now some products, and I will discuss this later in the podcast, are compostable or biodegradable. So even if you aren't using it for years and years, if you're able to then put it in the compost, As long as it's made properly with good ingredients, it should not have any toxins going into the earth or your compost when it does leave your life. Because nothing is ever thrown away or away, it's just somewhere else. So my sixth tip for living sustainably is if you have the resources and ability, try and grow your own food. This can start out as a small indoor herb garden or possibly a window box, and can evolve into growing fruits and vegetables, possibly outside. And if you live in a climate like I do, where the winter you're not able to grow anything outside, try to grow things inside, even if it's just a few herbs. My seventh tip for sustainable living is if you are able to do so, try to not use your car as much, try riding a bike, using public transit, again, if it's safe, I know we're in quarantine, and walking anywhere you can can have a huge difference on carbon emissions. I know in the U.S., and especially I live on the West Coast, things are very spread out and it's almost impossible not to use some sort of carbon, whether that's riding the bus, you know, you might not be able to walk everywhere or ride your bike. I understand things are very spread out. But just being able to make more conscious decisions. And if you do drive your car and you like driving your car, then just condensing all of your errands so you're not going out for just one thing and coming back and then going out a couple hours later for another thing. Really try to condense your trips. My eighth tip for sustainable living is look for fair trade products when ordering clothes and or food from overseas. The fair trade seal means that that item was made or grown in a sustainable way and that the workers are treated fairly. If it does not, that could mean that a food item was grown or made or a clothing item was made unsustainably and the workers could have possibly been exploited in the process. My ninth tip for making more sustainable choices is to donate clothes and house items you no longer need. Giving an item A second chance is a great way to make sure that it doesn't end up in the landfill. There are enough clothes in the world right now. If we stopped making clothes today and just upcycled materials or shopped at secondhand stores, there would be absolutely no need to make more clothes. Or we could make, quote, you know, kind of new clothes, but from old clothes and old materials. 
there's almost just a weird need to have new things. I, I understand having new things. I think a lot of people can understand that, but there are a lot of new items that are upcycled or that have been made from recycled things. I don't think everything needs to be new for everyone. I think you can still have that fun feeling of something new in your life without using up resources unnecessarily. And I think the idea that we need new things or new almost everything is a toxic way of thinking and living, in my opinion. And I think that's what I've been living in. Not so much recently, but um, over the past few years, I've noticed that it's really toxic. And I think that's a big reason, again, for doing this podcast, the blog, new way of living is to get out the toxins mentally and in my life physically. My 10th tip for living more sustainably is to try and go paperless as much as possible if you have the resources to do so. So if you have access to a scanner, scan in old documents, anything you are still holding on to that you might need for a later time but you don't need a tangible copy. Now, there are some items that you need a tangible copy, so don't go shredding everything just yet. This will also help with space and peace of mind. And back up any documents using an external hard drive so there's no stress about losing important information. So the second topic is greenwashing. And what is greenwashing? Greenwashing is a marketing tactic that aims to persuade people that a product is equal wear or environmentally friendly. Companies use buzzwords such as green, plant-based, clean, fresh, all natural, etc. to confuse consumers that a product is not harmful to the environment. These companies spend a lot of money marketing that they are green when they could just take that money and actually make a difference. So why would you greenwash a product? companies are out there to make a profit and so their main goal is to sell products so they rely on people not being as informed or in a rush and grabbing what they think might be a better choice. A lot of sustainable products or quote eco things are not sold in large stores. A lot of things as of right now are online or locally made in small batches There is a market for people who want to live more eco-friendly or sustainable or make better choices to help the planet, and so they're tapping into that and targeting people with products that are advertised as being equal wear or safer for the environment with taglines or putting grass or green or mountains on their packaging. If their packaging looks green, that doesn't mean anything. There can still be a lot of chemicals, especially in household products, that can be harmful to the earth and to our personal health. And so there is a market for this, but companies are exploiting it and tapping into it. So who greenwashes? Mainly, as of right now, it's very large companies wanting to sell more products or appear more eco-aware to attract people in that market that are more eco-aware and or wanting to help the environment with their purchasing choices. And so that's the biggest who in greenwashing are large companies wanting to sell more products. And so I have two hows in this category for greenwashing. So I'm first going to talk about how companies are getting away with it and how to not get tricked into purchasing greenwashed products. So first off, how are companies getting away with greenwashing? There are not a lot of regulations, and the government does not regulate words such as all natural and biodegradable. I was actually just reading a short article a couple years ago, California banned the use of labeling plastic products as biodegradable because that's a false statement, or they had certain biodegradable elements in them, 
but they were marketing the whole product as biodegradable, so they made that a law in California, at least, to ban the use of using biodegradable if it is a false statement. So another reason how these companies are getting away with greenwashing is cheating, and a very famous example of this was a Volkswagen cheated emissions tests because they installed something called a defeat device and that was able to detect when a car was being tested and would change its performance but when it was on the road it admitted 40 times the allowed emission of nitrogen oxide allowed in the U.S. so there was some sort of computer system that was able to detect when it was being tested and changed its performance. So that's one of the biggest examples of someone cheating to appear to be more environmentally friendly than they actually are. And another reason how companies are getting away with greenwashing is it might be us as consumers not being as aware. And I don't think that's any fault of our own. I think it's just a lot of subconscious things that we don't necessarily think about and associate with being green. We do associate th certain things like grass or mountains or plants on packaging and we just associate that, oh, maybe that is an ingredient in that product or, oh, that company is making strides to be more eco-friendly because as consumers we have been trained to think that in a way that, oh, if this item might be on the packaging, then that probably means that it is. And that is usually the case in most circumstances, but with greenwashing, that has no applicable value. So an example is, I'm sure we've seen, you know, a lovely mountain scene on a plastic water bottle and the words spring or clean or clear or something on it clean, you know, clean spring water or something, and that has nothing to do with the actual product itself, possibly. Those are just buzzwords that they've put over a pretty mountain scene to convince us that they are picking, you know, they're getting this water directly from the source, when in reality that's not the case. Another example is like placing a leaf conveniently next to the company's name, and it might not be so obvious that companies are greenwashing, but it is all around us. And once you see it, you will be able to make more informed decisions for yourself as a consumer. So how to not get tricked into purchasing greenwashed products. So the first one is probably the most important out of all of them, and it is to be an informed consumer. That is my main goal of this podcast and my own journey is to be educated and to educate others as well to the best of my abilities. Consumers have real power and I don't think that a lot of people understand that. I think we're able to see that more, especially with greenwashing as an example. Companies see that that is a market and it is growing and so that's the whole reason that they're trying to tap into that is they know that people want eco friendly products and it's our job as consumers to demand that there are regulations on certain terms or words put onto products and packaging. It is our job as consumers to make sure that if something is eco-friendly or sustainable or compostable or biodegradable that it truly is and that a company cannot get away with greenwashing anymore. So my second tip on how to not get tricked into purchasing greenwashed products is to look at the parent company. A lot of companies are a company within a company and the actual products that you're purchasing could be clean, but if a, a bigger company owns that smaller company, it's still it could be made in um, that larger company's factory, which is polluting waterways, for example, so that actual product could be considered clean, but how it is manufactured might not be because of the parent company. And this is also really huge when looking at a lot of these kind of greenwashed mini companies, I'd say. Some of them have been rebranded 
to have the word eco in it. And it really is just an offshoot of a big company acting like they have an eco line when it doesn't matter because if the parent company or the bigger company is still making unethical business choices or ecologically harming decisions, then that product in and of itself would not be considered clean in my opinion because it is part of that larger company. My third tip on not purchasing greenwashed products is cutting out fast fashion. It is an unsustainable process and greenwashing is starting to leak into that market as well. H&M is a pretty big example right now. They have a recycled campaign, I believe, for fall 2020. And as I was saying before, just because you have one product that is made from recycled materials, that doesn't mean anything because that larger company is still in charge and that that product was still made probably at the factory where they're polluting or how you know are exploiting laborers and their supply chain is still the same they still have sketchy laborers overseas and by company having a quote eco line doesn't mean that that company has changed they might be trying to make strides but you have to make sure that they are actually trying to help the planet instead of just having an offshoot of a green line that still keep some of their customers because they understand that a lot of their customers are starting to trend and go the more sustainable route or eco route or upcycled so they want to keep those customers but they don't want to make the full commitment to actually being a sustainable company with H&M the recycled clothes themselves truly may be upcycled or recycled materials I'm not trying to attack that it isn't So my fourth tip for avoiding greenwashed products are third-party endorsements. Now, this is a little bit tricky and a little bit more advanced when looking at products because a company can say a third party advocates that they are green or they support them, but for this there can be no evidence at all and it could be a flat lie altogether. So just be wary or maybe research if a company says that so-and-so endorses this product that you know and trust or that it seems would be a viable source to trust. Just make sure that you do your research. My fifth and last tip for avoiding greenwashed products is knowing the difference between greenwashing versus green marketing. So greenwashing, as we've said before, is a false statement and a false claim to being eco-aware or sustainable or all-natural or any of that. And green marketing is a real marketing campaign where a company is actually making strides to be, for example, carbon neutral by 2021 or making strides to only use recycled materials to make their clothing. So I think it's important to make sure that not everything that has grass on the packaging or a leaf by the name, some of them are actually sustainable or environmentally friendly, and you just have to weed out the ones that are not. So a couple of green marketing tactics are manufactured in a sustainable fashion, free of toxic materials or ozone depleting substances, able to be recycled and or is produced from recycled materials, made from renewable materials such as bamboo. Now that one's tricky because you have to make sure that the company is able to produce bamboo but also grow it at the same rate so it's not taking more than it's able to produce. And bamboo, I'm doing more research into bamboo. I don't know if it is as sustainable as people say it is. It does grow exponentially faster than other natural resources, but I think in certain products it's unnecessary to have bamboo and that is something that is also used in greenwashing is a bamboo handle might look attractive and eco-friendly 
and sustainable, but it might have been grown unsustainably, putting the bamboo on there to look eco-friendly. So you have to do your research on how the company is sourcing their bamboo and if they are able to sustainably grow it. So another green marketing tactic is does not use excessive packaging. And I've also seen a lot of companies say carbon neutral shipping as well as I mentioned before. And the last one is designed to be repairable rather than disposable. And that's one that I've really been honing in on when I've been looking at products to purchase, I'd say. Making sure that if I'm buying something, I want to repair it rather than dispose of it. And I think that is a newer, new age thing of thinking as you buy it and you just dispose, but you get a new one. You know, an example are printers. I remember we would, you know, the printer itself itself is relatively inexpensive compared to the ink. But then once the printer goes, it's more expensive to have them fix it. Or some, I remember we tried to get a printer fixed and they honestly didn't even know how to fix it. So they just recommended or gave us a voucher to just purchase another one and they threw it away. So that is extremely unsustainable. And I think repairable rather than disposable is something that has been lost. I think of it more, you know, I think that repairable rather than disposable is kind of more, it's been lost, you know, repairable or being able to repair things is kind of a lost art form in many different aspects. And I think that's something very important to look into is getting repairables rather than disposables. It's kind of a fine line between greenwashing and green marketing. You just have to make sure that those companies are doing what they are saying. So for example, the able to be recycled and or is produced from recycled materials. Any company that is a reliable company will tell you exactly on their website what's going into their products and for recycled materials, you know, where they're sourcing it, how they're making it, how they're upcycling, what the processes are. If they're not telling you that, then that's kind of a red flag. And if they're not telling you that, it might be a patented way of doing things or a patented material that they're using. But as a consumer, you know, reaching out and emailing their contact us or their email and saying, can you explain exactly how this is recycled materials because you're making this claim, but you're not exactly telling us. And any company that is green marketing should be able to back up their claims to being eco-friendly and anyone that is greenwashing will not be able to do that. So this is a personal suggestion and it is to go check out Patagonia Footprint. Patagonia is one of my favorite brands. I am really impressed with their transparency when it comes to their supply chain and they have a really interesting section on their website about their footprint in the world and I will link that in the show notes and on my blog when it is launched. They are an example of a green marketing company with more information than any other company I've personally found at this point and goals that they have strategic plans to complete. They are to me a really big pioneer for such a large company to be so transparent about their business practices and their supply chain and how they're actually helping communities where they're getting their cotton or other materials or upcycling certain materials and they do have a higher price point but I think it's worth it because you are supporting, well, if I purchase something, I am supporting a company with beliefs that are aligned with mine, values that are aligned with mine. And even if they aren't perfect right at this moment, they are making strides and goals, I would say better than most of the clothing lines out there right now, especially with outdoor. That's hard because you want to be able to give back to the environment, especially if you're purchasing from an outdoor outfitter. Patagonia, our footprint is really interesting and they have a lot of different things, how they're helping communities and the environment and how everything is working together in their company. 
That is going to wrap up our third podcast episode of Green Living Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I can be found on Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest at Green Living Pod. That's at G R E E N L I V I N G P O D. I have some exciting news. I have a website that is coming soon. I'm currently trying to design the template and get everything set up for a launch, hopefully in the next week or two. So if you follow me on any social medias, you'll be notified when that is launched. And I will also mention it on the podcast when it is ready to go. Thank you so much for listening.